Hello and welcome to this episode of Nothing Ventured with me, Arish Shah. Uh, today I have with me Samir Singh. Samir is the creator and educator at breadcrumb.vc and applied networks effects course. He is an Atomico angel and a venture partner with Speed Invest. If you want to hear more about Samir's background, do check out our primer episode. In today's episode, we talk about what network effects actually are and why they're important, why Be Real fell off a cliff uh, last year, um, what investors and founders get wrong about network effects, and why Samir prefers missionary over mercenary founders. This is a great episode. You're not going to want to miss a second of it. Hello and welcome to this episode of Nothing Ventured with me, Ari Shah. Today in the studio with me, I have Samir Singh. Uh, Samir is a creator, educator, networks effects advisor at Breadcrumb VC. He is also a Atomico angel and venture partner with Speed Invest. If you want to get a bit of background about Samir, do listen to our primer episode, which you can find on Nothing Ventured on YouTube, Spotify, or wherever you search for your podcast. Samir, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, Arish. Awesome. Well, let's dive straight in. We talked quite a fair amount about uh, network effects during uh, your primer, uh, but I want to dig a bit deeper, right? So I appreciate you have a whole course on this and I don't want to uh, completely decimate your IP, but uh, can you give us a summary of what network effects, I'm going to call them NFX uh, uh, moving forward, maybe for, for ease, uh, what they are and why they're important in marketplace and consumer businesses? Well, the basic definition of it is that the addition of a user increases the value or utility of the product for all users. That's the basic definition of a network effect. In practice, what that means is that uh, the core product is an interaction between two or more users. Right? That's the That relationship is the core product. So that would apply to a social network, it would apply to a marketplace, it would apply to a collaboration tool like Slack. There's lots of different areas that you might see. Even Carter has uh, has network effects, right? Um, Sorry, what was the the next next question? Yeah, so so why are they important and uh, what is this? Yeah, you right. know, what is the summary? Yeah, um, the importance of them comes down to the fact that it gives you two really big advantages. Mm -hmm. One is it makes your business, I mean, massively scalable in the best case scenario, which means users are going to get more and more valuable over time. So unit economics when you start making money should be should get better and better over time. Uh, of course, there's exceptions to this. If you have weak network effects, it might not sort of pan out. Uh, the second benefit is defensibility. Strong network effects are probably the strongest form of defensibility that you can have. And again, there's a spectrum here. You can have weak network effects as well. But if you get both of those right, they can lead to super outsized outcomes. Effectively, you're crowding out other players from the space because you are Essentially, nobody can market. compete with you yeah. because you have the most valuable yeah. product. Yeah. Uh, so Airbnb being like the classic winner take all, take all model. Like there's nobody else doing what Airbnb does because it's fundamentally not possible to compete with them. And based on this, the VC firm NFX just ran some numbers and they figured out that since 95 of all the companies that have reached a billion dollars in value, 35% uh, of them had network effects, which mm -hmm. seems like a lot, right? But those companies account for 70% of the total value. Amazing. So just in terms of the amount of value creation uh, that has happened over the last 30 years, network effects have been at the center of them. Uh, and fundamentally, I, I I still don't think most people understand a lot about them outside of this basic construct of what the network effect is. And they're often confused with virality. They're confused with, you know, straightforward inventory carrying businesses. There's lots and lots of confusion as to, as to what they are. But when you drill down into what a network effect is, when it's strong and provided the execution was right, it's almost sort of a bulletproof way to to build a valuable company. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. And in fact, I mean, one of, one of the questions I have is, okay, you know, you just mentioned that a lot of people get confused uh, with virality, et cetera, et cetera. So what are the challenges when building uh, a business reliant on network effects? And what do founders and indeed investors get wrong about network effects? Like how do they, you know, how, how do they differentiate between a business that has maybe strong virality, but not network effects or vice versa? Well, the, the easy answer is the vast majority of founders and investors don't. <laughs> Uh, I, mean, I, I cannot tell you the number of pitches I've received both from founders and from other investors going, hey, this is a network effects company and it, essentially it's not. The definition of virality is that products, uh, uh, sorry, uh, users spread the word about the product in process of using it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, on some vague way, it sort of looks like a network effect. It sort of, people associate network effect with growth. Yeah. Uh, and so they essentially go, this company 
has it has product led growth but therefore it has network effect which is not true mm. and there's other companies that sort of look like marketplaces but they're carrying their own inventory like gorillas right mm. uh lots of people said oh this is the next great marketplace no sorry it's not a marketplace it there's no seller there they're the seller yeah and so that's essentially the same as tesco it's just <laughs> that they have an app yeah. uh they only have an app to sell stuff you yeah. heard it here first gorillas <laughs> is just like tesco <laughs> and yeah so that that a recurring problem but even when you do sort of correctly identify that this is a network effect business a really common pitfall uh especially among generalist investors uh who are sort of backing founders in the space is that you push for growth too early mm-hmm. because you go if it's growing it's working that is categorically not true at pre-seed and seed essentially if you want to a uh, network effect business to work you first need to establish strong engagement and or retention within their other that early customer base mm-hmm. at that point growth is not important if you have a flat user base that is fine if there's, there's enough users there for you to have a liquid network and you have strong engagement that is fine that's a great starting point uh do not push for growth before your engagement and retention looks like it's in the right place and repeatedly i've seen this pattern where and this often happens when it's um, a pre-seed founder who's sort of building a a marketplace or a network and he's hired a generalist investor on board and they go right raise your next round you need to be growing at this percent uh, month on month terrible advice <laughs> that that is not what you should be doing as a marketplace uh, or network fundamentally what your engagement and retention and what that looks like will be different for different types of products mm-hmm. that should be uh, should be especially strong strong it's only when you get that right when you have your minimum viable network that's when you can start to scale this thing and that's when you can start to grow uh, and so if you if i look at uh, my most uh, success, successful investment so far at least in terms of traction hubbard and smitten they both had 5000 monthly active users when i invested the user base was flat mm-hmm. uh, the monthly active user base was not growing their engagement was through the roof uh, and the, the ingredients were there whenever they wanted to grow this thing they could you, you just had to fix a few things in, on the onboarding flow the product essentially put some effort into into your gtm and it would grow and it did mm mm-hmm. And and I guess a related question then, right? So, what sort of metrics, what sort of KPIs should should network effects founders and indeed investors be looking at? What are what are the core core things that are important, right? Is it retention? Is it engagement? Is it monthly active users? Is it something else altogether? The one rule you need to follow there is that activity needs to outpace adoption. So. as a company grows essentially what you should be looking at is your cohorts right so that could be that retention cohorts but also engagement cohorts but when you're looking at a pre seed seed company you don't have enough data for cohorts to form so a hack there is to look at the average engagement per user so let's say it's a social network like snapchat right the core interaction in that is sending or disappearing photo to somebody else mm-hmm. so number of photos sent per user per day or per week how is that cha- uh, changing as you get more users the network should get more valuable which means users should be doing more mm-hmm. that means the number of photos sent should be going up not only per u- not not only uh uh the the total volume but per, per user, user. Yeah. exactly per yeah. user so that's when you know the the interaction is actually working mm-hmm. because let's say you've gone from i don't know 3000 monthly active users to 15000 monthly active users but the average picture sent per user has gone down from 5 to 4 to 4 or to 3 fundamentally something's not working yeah engagement's dropped off yeah and yeah. so you've added more users but not, nothing has happened so where's your what happened to your network effect yeah. it means the interaction's not working yeah is that th- that actually leads to an interesting question like are there businesses where network effects effectively then then can have an opposite ex- effect like i i i get the feeling especially with some social networks especially social networks that are very focused on a particular niche or cohort as the user base grows and you get more and more users potentially not that core kind of um cohort of users that that really you know evangelize the product from day one really loved it started using it but the more users you get and potentially you get bad actors you potentially get sort of um you know negative nodes almost you mm-hmm. know cropping up which which depletes from the experience does mm-hmm. that ever happen or is that is that kind of I mean, something that that's essentially an execution happen? failure right? right so if you've one of the big parts about building a network is that the users effectively are part of the product right mm-hmm. so which users come on to the product is a decision you need to make as a founder mm-hmm. so obviously you you know you found let's say a, a great cohort of early adopters who love this product who that solves a huge problem for them what's the next cohort uh you need to make a conscious decision about who what kind of users those are you know sometimes it will happen accidentally where some types of users show up and it doesn't work for them 
then you learn from that and you stop going after those users and go after the users that it does make sense for. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, and of course, bad actors are essentially a curation mechanism. If you, uh, that's a curation problem. If they come onto the product, you're not able to keep them away. You need to create some sort of mechanism within the uh, uh, the product to sort of get, get them out. So either that's, you know, things like, basic things like likes and shares, which is called community curation, or essentially you're essentially weeding them out yourself, which is more manual. Uh, there's sort of multiple mechanisms you can use that come into play at different stages of your growth. Uh, but essentially that's that's on you uh, to ensure it doesn't happen. Yeah, I mean, the, the reason I ask that question, I'm thinking very specifically about sort of Instagram, face, uh, sorry, not Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, especially, right, where actually a usage of Facebook seems to be dropping um you know even be real you know fell off a cliff at the end of uh, yep. at the end of last year in terms of its users and so on so what is it wh- i guess the question i'm trying to drive at maybe is uh, is there a point in the life cycle where where that growth does either plateau or drop off uh and what is it that potentially drives that sort of drop off so if you look at facebook and be real i think they're two fundamentally different drivers there yeah with Facebook, it's more straightforward. There's a concept called network pollution in um, in social networks. It's, it's a kind of negative network effect. Mm-hmm. Basically, what happens is once the amount of content in your feed grows beyond a point, irrelevant content makes it harder to find relevant content. So, you know, posts from your grandma uh, or, or your great-grand-aunt are drowning out posts from your friends. Now, to some extent, the algorithm is going to solve that, which is one mechanism of curation. But if in that process that has driven away more positive participants, uh, that's more and more hard uh, hard to fix at that point, right? So, so I think what's happened with Facebook is that the younger generation has never adopted it. Yeah. Uh, so essentially, the generation that adopted it is basically stuck with it, and a few of them are starting to drop off into Instagram and other posts. So that's a more fundamental sort of curation network pollution issue. This is a, it's the construct of the network, uh, and. Over a long time scale, that potentially could happen to a uh, uh, to a social network, and and of course Facebook is yeah. whatever twenty five yeah, yeah, plus years. Yeah, uh, be real is a fundamentally different um, issue. There, there's a concept uh, that I talk about in the course called the spontaneous togetherness problem, which is when you're trying to get people to engage together in real time in real time yeah. in sort of a spontaneous mechanism is it, and it's not like a you know a scheduled thing like uh, like skype right where you go or you know we we've scheduled this podcast and we're having this this engagement like this is fine but all of a sudden hey take a picture to uh, to see your friends there's been a couple of social networks built on that uh, concept meerkat periscope house party uh the original iteration of Clubhouse, Clubhouse actually managed to fix that issue. They had a different issue. <laughs> uh, but Be Real kind of fell into essentially the same same trap. So if you look at both House Party and Be Real, uh, either you send people lots of notifications to ensure that you know they can they tap on one of those to, and, yeah, and, and, then then it, and then it becomes annoying and people or, start. Yeah. Or you just send them one notification and you don't have enough engagement in the app. Mm. So essentially what that's kind of what's what's happened with, with Be Real. Most people aren't doing anything interesting when the notification shows up. Uh, and so fundamentally there's, there's not a, with products like that, once you essentially when gain initial critical mass, you need to essentially pivot to reorient the product towards something else. Mm-hmm. Uh, and none of those products have ever managed to do that because that's hard. Mm. Uh, I think that's the core of the issue. The interaction itself is challenging. Yeah. It, it, it's in a way in trying to have constructed something that was meant to be natural and, uh, and, and sort of spontaneous, they've actually they've actually gone the other way because people are then struggling with being natural or spontaneous in the moment. And interesting at the same time. And interesting at the same time, right? Which is the whole point, you know, which is why you see Instagram, uh, you know, posts which, you know, uh, which show the reality versus the versus the the photo, right? Like people like to construct the situation and, and show themselves in a certain way. And I think uh, that that becomes harder. Not that I've ever used Be Real, so I can't, <laughs> I can't yeah, say too much in, on Instagram's, it. Instagram's, that construct of Instagram of having the perfect picture, it does create avenues for startups to disrupt them. But the interaction you use to disrupt them needs to be one that is actually scalable. Uh, and so that that's always challenging. Yeah. So a little bit of a sidebar. Uh, so the re- we, we, we're recording this uh, about four or five days after the collapse of SVB. W- was that collapse a result of NF- network effects working essentially in reverse? <laughs> it's an interesting question. I, I probably wouldn't say so. I, I, I'm, I'm very pedantic about network effects. Uh, the specific definition is 
the uh, the value of a product increases as you add more users. I mean, there's no product here. Essentially, what we're talking about is word of mouth. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's virality. 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 Yeah, yeah. So yeah, exactly. uh, you you might say virality is is the cause for. Uh, for SVB's collapse, it was the first bank run in the era of social media. Word spreads very quickly, uh, so that's sort of an interesting dynamic. But no, not a network effect problem. Okay, well, I I, I guess I'm going to have to trash that thesis and throw it in the bin. Um, but look, let's talk about Breadcom for a second, right? Just to to change tack a little bit. Um, what was it? I mean, you talked a little bit about the genesis uh, during the primary episode, right? You were writing a blog and then you moved on and turned it into a course, but fundamentally there must have been something that drove you to start that blog in the first place i mean were you just sort of writing for yourself or you and then essentially found that others were were interested or or how did that all kind of come about and and where do you see it going uh, i've read james courier uh james courier's nfx essays for quite a while i've mm -hmm. read sort of a couple of other uh, uh marketplace investors i think of really highly like jeff jordan for example josh brinlinger and so I've, I've always been amazed at the level of clarity in the in their posts, right? Uh, but essentially, when I started thinking about the kind of companies or the kind of problems that, uh, for example, Apani customers uh, were facing, uh, I felt like a lot of the stuff I've read didn't really answer them, or at least not to a, a specific enough degree. So I was like, okay, maybe there's a couple of things that, that I've learned that I can write about, uh, and just to make it really easy for founders to apply these frameworks in to their companies, to real world context, not just from a theoretical point of view. Uh, and so that was the genesis of the first couple of essays. And every time I wrote something that opened up a new question, well, what about this? And so I was like, okay, I need to think about uh, how this exactly, how this works. And I had some, some sort of ideas that weren't quite well formed, but when you when you write, uh, you kind of put, the, uh, put your thoughts in order, right? That helps. And sort of one post essentially led to the other. Uh, and like, I had no idea that I was going to essentially write 24 or 25 essays about this. I thought I'd write like two or three. Uh, but that then sort of just flowed out from from each other. And so right now, I, I still write, but I, st I write whenever there's something new to write about. I'm not a big fan of uh, Pushing writing for the, the sake of, of it. Yeah, yeah. For the sake of it. Uh, when I have some value to add, I will. So when, uh, during the whole Web3 craze, a lot, a lot of people are like, yeah, these are the new uh, the new forms of network effect. These are uh, the future of the internet and stuff like that. So there was some accuracies and there are a lot of inaccuracies. So, uh, well, let's talk about that for a second, right? Because obviously the whole, the whole, uh, fundamental, um, premise around web three was you, you are creating, uh, essentially, um, decentralized, right? Node to node kind of businesses or applications or, or whatever you want to call it. Obviously the, the most, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the most essential part of that ultimately was sort of the creation of a DAO, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, uh, decentralized autonomous organization. So what, what did they get wrong about the, uh, about network, network effects effectively? Well, I think the first thing is, I mean, there's a lot of confusion of what network, network effects were. I mean, putting a chat group together does not create a network effect. Mm. Like you know, our WhatsApp groups don't have network effects, probably because, you know, once you get past 50, it becomes a bit unmanageable. Mm. And so your network effects, quote unquote, peter out very, very quickly. Yeah. People uh, disengage. They yeah, and yeah. so that, that's that's sort of the, a more basic construct. But at an even more basic level than that, uh, decentralization is a great ethos, right? It's a great ideology. You're trying to break up companies that might have too much power over your lives. Fantastic, great. That doesn't necessarily mean that's solving a problem. And that was missing in this whole Web3 wave. Nobody was actually focused on what problem they were solving for. Yeah, they, they wanted the philosophy. The philosophy was Yeah, we have this philosophy and therefore we've yeah. got a decentralized social network. And big whoop, who cares? Uh, everyone who who's fascinated with Web3 cares. That's not a huge group of people. You're not going to build a successful company based off of that. Mm. And I think that problem plagued at least pretty much every uh, Web3 company that I've seen. Uh, and when I say Web3, I mean the company itself is decentralized or the yep. project itself is de decentralized. There's a couple of interesting companies in that ecosystem, like Dune Analytics I'm a huge fan of, because if the bet is that crypto continues to exist and evolve long-term, you want to study this ecosystem. There's other people's building SQL queries for uh, for data that you might want to want to see. Like I've used it uh, personally, like it's basically GitHub for crypto data. So mm -hmm. I, I love that company. Uh, but like the, the actual core Web3 applications themselves, so far I haven't seen anything that's, that's useful. And in fact, in the social network space, we had Macedon, which obviously became 
a bit of a craze when Twitter looked like it was imploding a little bit, but actually People hasn't. It. Yeah, but actually hasn't managed to get you know yeah. get the traction that it was looking for. And yeah. then outside of this, there was also this whole uh, construct of uh, tokens being used to bootstrap networks, which I mean, the, I found that that discussion completely hilarious to be honest, because the the whole reason a network works is because who the users are is important to the network. Initial users you get on are the ones who care deeply about the problem you're solving, and therefore they increase the value of the network. Mm. Just giving people to given giving a random person a, a token and getting them on the network doesn't increase the, uh, the value of the network if they do not care about the problem. And when you're giving people to giving tokens away, essentially the kind of people you're attracting are you know we have we kind of have this subgroup within the Web three uh, ecosystem. Unfortunately, that are it's fairly scammy and it's fairly sort of, etc et uh, and it's fairly it's largely based on financial engineering and financial upside mm -hmm. and speculation basically so you're inviting a bunch of speculators into your product that's not going to increase the value of your network essentially It'll what's going to happen effect, yeah. yeah and that's what that's what happens you on a lot of these products basically tend to have these massive collapses very rapidly after they after they launch and that's all down to this problem of your incentivizing adoption adoption needs to be incentivized by the problem you're solving not by your token yeah yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. But we were we were talking about breadcrumbs. So where where do you see breadcrumb going now? So you you don't want to create keep creating content for the sake of content. So uh, and only start sort of writing. Um, you know where where you see a new issue yeah. that, that or a new thought that, yeah. that that you've had. So yeah, but where where do you see breadcrumb going? I mean, essentially, I think of it as a resource for learning about network effects. Right, uh, a lot of the sort of big hairy issues of how network effects work. I've tried to address that already. Mm. Uh, so I'll, increasingly, a lot of the topics that come up might be more topical, things like generative AI, things like uh, like Web3. So I've written a couple of things about those. Uh, I might write, write some of those on the Speed Invest blog as well, for example. So mm -hmm. generative AI, I wrote, about, I wrote about that on the Speed Invest blog. But I really think of breadcrumb.vc as a destination for where you go when you want to learn about network effects. And uh, uh, if people want to... Uh, People read that and they want to take the full course. They can come take applied network effects, which is essentially that, but deeper and uh, with sort of real world exercises you can apply uh, apply this to. So that's what that's what I think of it, it as. It's basically a, a go to resource for network effects. Hopefully, it stays that way and it become does not become irrelevant. But if it's be becomes irrelevant, then I have more motivation to write. Then there's uh, something I haven't addressed. Yeah, yeah, and and to be you know to be fair to your point earlier. You know, if seventy percent of the value created by thirty-five percent of the businesses were network effects businesses. Clearly, there is opportunity there, and I think this is probably the other thing. You know, and we'll come on to it on on our uh, on my final kind of question is because because there's a lot of noise around network effects, right? In the sense that, as you said earlier, many businesses, many founders, many investors get it wrong, whether it's virality as opposed to network effects or, or whatever it might be. That means that the opportunities to create true network effects are limited, right? R depends on the product. And therefore, actually, you know, there will be new new use cases for that that crop up, which, you know, you will probably study and 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 take new lessons from, right? Uh, because every time, you know, to your point, uh, you know, during the primer, it's not about what the technology is, it's about whether those network effects can be created. And we don't know where those you know where those network effects are going to be created to, you know to your earlier point no one knew that renting out your futon in, in your room was going to turn into airbnb or no one knew that you using black cars you know would turn into uber etc cetera, etc cetera, right so i think um I, I think at the end of the day we're not moving away from a world of interconnectedness which is essentially what net network yep. effects brings we're moving towards more connectedness yep. and therefore there are going to be more and more opportunities for for businesses in that space this is how, how i think about it so Essentially, when you look at a business, a lot of people look at the commercial case first, right? How do you make money? How do you do this stuff like that? Behind that is how the users or the customers in the product are connected to each other. Yeah, That's the skeleton, and the commercial case is the meat on top. Uh, a lot of times, both founders and investors just kind of put meat on it without any bones, and it all falls, flat, uh, falls, falls down, right? You need to create the skeleton first. You need to understand how those connections exist in the first place, how they work. Um, and they, basically, that's what breadcrumb VC does. Uh, it helps you understand that. Now, over the very long term, does breadcrumb VC become a fund? That I don't know know, know yet. The, there's I still don't know whether uh, that's a good idea or I should uh, join a fund, for example. 
the trade offs there are significant trade on one one end you have sort of complete autonomy uh but you have all of the admin and and you got to go and raise some capital and, and if i'm doing all of that how much time am i spending with founders mm-hmm. that's that's an open question on the other end you have less autonomy because not only do you you know not making decisions by yourself you're you're convincing the firm to be able to invest in a, in a startup but there is no admin so at least or, or rather there's less admin less overhead yeah less admin less overhead and so i'm spending more time with the companies that I'm that I'm working with and actually making an impact on that business. So that's the the trade off there. I don't have a firm answer for that yet. Uh uh there's sort of positives on uh, on both sides. Uh that's something to uh, to keep in mind. That's why I'm I, I, I'm not about to say that Vectrum or VC is going to be a fund for sure. Like I don't know the, the answer to that for sure. Yeah, no that that makes a lot of sense and look I mean I for one will certainly be be keeping an eye on on, on what you get up to there. Uh just as we sort of wrap up like one of the thoughts that I've had and and feel free to like challenge my assumptions on this is that especially with marketplace businesses you know you need to uh secure quite a substantial um, uh, so, uh part of one side of the the marketplace right you either need to uh, get significant enough supplies on board that it makes it valuable for 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 uh, the demand side or vice versa right so that essentially to me suggests that marketplaces uh require a substantial amount of capital um to to scale either side of that 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 marketplace um is that correct and you know what is your advice to founders who are building in this space and especially in this sort of quite uh significant sort of pullback in the in the funding ecosystem how should they be approaching um building a marketplace today i i don't actually if you're building a true marketplace or a true network fundamentally you shouldn't require as much capital you require you're right that you have the cold start problem in the beginning uh but generally that cold start problem is rarely ever solved with capital throwing money at it got it usually you're trying and uh, trying a you know a hacky way of acquiring users you go to one set of users and you go hey uh, this is going to be really valuable for you you're sell- selling the promise essentially to them and then you leverage that promise to get the other side on as well uh and so once you solve that cold start problem as you start to scale fundamentally it should become easier and easier to scale now i get this quite a bit of diversity within network effect if it's a hyper local network effect like uber then you're right then you need a lot of capital because you're basically solving that in every single city got it like that's a problem but if you're airbnb like as you start to scale the marketplace becomes more valuable and more valuable and more valuable and so like fundamentally the unit economics have always been extremely healthy because of that yeah right? which is why during the pandemic as an example they were able to like pull back costs really really quickly and still and and, yeah. and still come out stronger actually yeah. essentially yeah and so uh and it goes for, this goes for most social networks as well social networks fundamentally are very very capital like they, they don't need a ton of capital uh that they, they don't need a ton of employees as well which is why I'm a bit surprised about how many employees facebook hired over, over the pandemic well they've just sat and they've just sacked like whatever uh, pretty much yeah you don't need thousand. that many yeah, yeah. uh so once you kind of build out the business side then sure uh, for for running your ad unit you need a bit more there but for running the product itself you don't need a ton uh of uh, of employees so fundamentally they're more capital light compared to an a purely enterprise sales business that needs a massive sales force yeah. uh an inventory carrying business that requires you to actually go and buy inventory working capital and so uh, yeah there, there's some software companies that might be light or figma for example but figma again is a network uh, it's not sort of pure uh, pure saas um uh, so yeah i i'd say most network effect companies are fairly capital light yeah so and so advice to founders so you know this this podcast is called nothing ventured for a reason uh, it's about backing yourself taking that first step you've obviously taken a lot of first steps so you know uh be it you know getting into venture uh in, into a in, into a startup and then setting up you know uh, breadcrumb.vc and uh, and then getting into venture directly so what advice would you give to anyone who is looking to either build in the in in the network effect space or uh essentially uh, invest in the network space of uh, uh network effect space today what's the first step that they should take the first step is to ask yourself what you're passionate about in it's always hard to build something new irrespective of what it is whether it's small whether it's going to be big it's going to be a, a hard slog uh there's going to be days you think you're failing it's going to be a lot of days you think you're failing yeah <laughs> uh and at that point the only thing that's going to keep you going obviously one is discipline discipline which i think most founders need but also you need to genuinely care about what you're doing uh, and if you don't it's going to be much harder to push yourself uh, and so this is one reason why i 
prefer missionary founders over mercenary ones? Like, do you just want to build a company or do you care about solving a particular problem and why? Kind of what's the story behind that, uh, behind how you came across that problem? That's pretty important. That founding story takes you a long way. Uh, that's one. Second, a lot of times founders go, I need to build this instead in order to please VCs. Like, don't do that. Yeah. Uh, v- what VCs like is going to change by the, uh, by, you know, uh, whatever's turned up today. So, yeah. now, so now everyone wants to build on chat GPT yeah. four or whatever. So, yeah. Don't do that. Like yeah. f- focus on what's right for the problem you're trying to solve. And, uh, as long as, you know, the fundamentals behind that product are, are right. Uh, you should be able to build a meaningful business. If the fundamentals behind the product aren't right, so the problem you're solving isn't right, or you know the the construct of the network doesn't quite work, then you got to think about okay, how what how can you pivot this network while still solving that problem you care about? You know, sometimes it might be possible, sometimes it might not be, but at least you're thinking about it the right way. Uh, I, I think that's really important. Don't build for investors. Build for the user, the customer, and for the problem you care about. Yeah, and and I think that's sage advice, not just for network effects, for for any business. And I think you know a lot of uh, businesses have suffered or failed because they've you know they they've they've built exactly as you say for what what they expect investors to want, and they've treated the fundraising as a goal rather than creating you know a valuable uh, business or a valuable product. Uh, and uh, as a result, you know have have unfortunately fallen over. Uh, Samir, it's been absolutely incredible having you here in the studio with me today. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. For our listeners, if they're looking for you online where can they find you uh, are you on LinkedIn are you on Twitter where can they look for breadcrumb what's the best place uh, for oh them man to find I'm, I'm everywhere so if you want to if you want to learn more about network effects go to breadcrumb VC or you can search for applied network effects which is my course I'm on LinkedIn you can search for me by my name Samir Singh and uh, I'm on Twitter as Samir underscore Singh 17 because unfortunately Indian names are way too common yeah, they really are Samir thank you so much for joining me today thank you Arish this is fun.